And thank you for CETA for inviting us here today to talk about uh, Brunswick Street project. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed all, all the spe speakers up to this point, and I suppose it's all very relevant to us in MOLA and what we're doing with regard to Revit and BIM Level 2. And today, I suppose I'm going to speak more about the, the micro. I'm just going to talk about what it's like to start working on a, a Revit project when you've been used to 2D AutoCAD. Um, and just the challenges and the possibilities. Um, and I suppose just to give you an, an idea of your starting off in your office, uh, the challenges you're going to face. Uh, so just an, a brief introduction to MOLA. It was founded in 2010. Um, and this is just really to do with uh, BIM. Uh, our first project was in 2013. And currently we've uh, 45 staff and at least half of us are using Revit. Um, some recent projects completed in Revit, uh, one with Mullane, um, TC1, TC2, Cherrywood planning application and Capital Dock fit out. And we currently have five um, projects that are BIM level two in the office at different stages. Okay, so um, when we looked at putting this case study together, we had um, a brief look at the evolution of student accommodation, because this is a student accommodation building we're going to be talking about, one of the, the largest in Dublin with 571 beds. Um, so I'm just going to pass it over to Sean very briefly just to talk about this um, little study here. Thanks, Sean. Sean Thanks, Sean. Sorry, I'm going to move. Sit in the distractions. I'm not sure why I'm here. <laughs> I have the distinction of concluding a uh, three-dimensional model in 1973 at UCLA. Um, Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Uh, so just to give you a um, little background to the project, it, it's been officially called Art Carn House. Um, the client is Global Student Accommodation GSA, uh, who are based in the UK. Uh, they started in 1991 with 100 student beds, and they now have uh, accommodation all around the world for students. This site, uh, you can see there on the right, is uh, 0.76 hectares. Um, just so you can just see the area there, I won't, won't run, run through it all, but it started on site uh, January last year with Bennett Construction. It's a design-build contract, and it's due for completion um, at the end of this month. Uh, it already has 
um, five blocks handed over, uh, the seven blocks in total, so we've two more to go. But so just to give you um, a little background to myself and this project, uh, I joined MOLA in August last year, so the project was on site. Um, I took over as project architect, and a lot of the hard work had, had been done, the structural model and the architectural model had been coordinated, clashes had been sorted out from, from that level. So when I joined, it was about getting packages out to site, um, partitions, setting out, finishes, so we were kind of uh, in, the, in the middle of all that, and on site it was just uh, the, the superstructure was going up. So I suppose for me, I had done a, a three-day Revit Essentials course a couple of years before, and I really enjoyed it. I suppose I drew this little drawing here. When I, when I did the course, it, it was mind-blowing. Um, just the capabilities of Revit and BIM was very exciting. But unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to work on a Revit project straight away, so I had a, I had a gap, and then I started in August. So I compare it to, it's like learning a new language. Um, I think a few people have mentioned all the acronyms and standards that you have to get familiar with. Um, and that can be a, a bit uh, mind-blowing, which is where the little diagram came from. But um, I suppose I was, I was, I was in at the, the, the deep end and I had a, good, a great team around me, so we, um, we uh, got there in, in the end and I, I, I started to really enjoy working on the project and get, just getting to understand uh, Revit and how the, the BIM Level 2 process works. So it's briefly the pros and cons, and this is kind of from, you know, the, there's a lot of them, but these, these were the, the strongest ones for me. Uh, the pros, obviously, collaboration and shared information. Um, seeing the project from every angle, you know, as a designer, being able to just turn the model whatever way you want, walk through it, um, stand in different areas of a large space and, and see what everything looks like was very useful. Realistic images were possible, um, they aided our design, quick design options. Um, I just showed the, I put up these two images here, the one on the left is a CGI of the entrance area, the one on the right is an actual photo of the entrance area. This is a very complicated space to design with the services, um, big transfer beams, there was a lot going on in this space. and. We really found Revit a very useful tool, and you can see what we imagined it to look like is very similar to what it did end up looking like. Um, if I didn't like um, Revit for anything else, I would love it for scheduling alone. <laughs> there was over 2,000 doors in this job, and being able to do that uh, through Revit and not manually uh, was, was delightful <laughs> coming from that. Uh, many hours of doing, doing scheduling in my past. And then clash detection. Um, clashes is a word I got very familiar with early on. Um, anyone that works in Revit will know it's all about just um, looking at the different model, the structural, the m and &E, and just um, going through all, all the clashes and eliminating them. Uh, the cons, the biggest con I think for me starting off was just relearning how long it's going to take to do packages when you're trying to get information to site. Uh, it's just, it's, it just doesn't take the same time. Things that are very quick in AutoCAD were slower and vice versa. Um, one example is reflected ceiling plans. In, in AutoCAD they're usually very quick to generate. You're just putting circles and rectangles on your plan usually fast to get out. Uh, in Revit, it's a, it's a different story. You're actually cutting a hole in plasterboard. You're, you're placing a light fitting. Um, there's just a whole other layer to it. Um, we, do, we did struggle and we do still work on trying to get good quality 2D drawings out of the model. Uh, design decisions need to be considered early on to avoid repetition. That's just the, the sooner you know what you're putting into the model, the better, because then you're not going back and working on it again uh, later on. Uh, working with BIM, just a few um, lessons, I suppose. Communication, I just put up 
that, that up first. It's like any other project you work on, any other program. Uh, good communication is the key to success. Um, we had a good team that sat down um, every week. We had a BIM manager, Antonio, sat down with us and we, we looked through uh, what we called the health of the model, which is related back to clashes, um, just to see how, how we were getting on with that and also to program uh, getting information to site. And with that, the more I learned about how Revit works, how families are made, um, the better I got at estimating that as well, because I was understanding more what the BIM technicians were, were doing in the office and how long each process would take. Um, we had some conversations um, about in the office at different times when we were doing different packages about I was trying to understand how much detail do we have to put into different elements one one thing we looked at was the flooring initially you know we started off if a room was a rectangle the flooring was put in as a rectangle but then we're like well what happens at the door uh, do we have to can we just draw the floor going straight along and leave a little gap under the door or do we have to notch in the floor everywhere and in a large building like this that was that was quite a bit of work and I remember Antonio and myself had this conversation and he made the point that you should model the same way as you build and that was very useful for me I always I kept coming back to that if I was in doubt about how we should proceed um, with with making families um, and modeling different elements in, 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 in the model. So we did cut around. If the floor is going to go halfway under the door, that's, that's what we did in, in the model. Um, and also, um, some of the acronyms I learned, BEP and LODs, uh, the BIM execution plan and the level of detail. We just, you know, I learned to refer to this. And we all did in the team just when we were doing new elements creating new families what level of detail is is required what has the client asked for what have we agreed to deliver um, and then just to think about everything that that you model before you go and work on it and and to do that as a team you know to sit down and think about what what you need uh, an example here is our external wall that's just a little uh, small little image there on, on the right Initially, our external wall was one was one family, with every layer from the brickwork to the plasterboard internally, and then we we thought about that more and realised there's a there's going to be concrete columns in the middle of these walls, and if we don't break up the external wall into um, further elements, we're going to have an external wall just running over the column and it's just not going to look right and it's going to be hard to 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 deal with in the model so it, you know the external wall sh should be broken up into smaller elements just little things like that you're always um, looking at and, and considering as you're working on on the model um, and just to and just to kind of to to repeat that just you know to agree a strategy for modeling and for the graphical data in the model. Um, advantages for the, the client then, I uh, just thought we'd, we'd look at this as well, um, better visualization for them to know what their end product is, is going to be. Realistic CGI's for marketing was very important for this client because they started advertising these, um, these bedrooms months ago so they wanted good quality images. So again on the left is a CGI of one of the courtyards and on the right is um, a progress photo of, of the courtyard so you can see the, the similarity and that on the right top right is a CGI of the bedroom. Um, clash detection again this comes back to efficiency trying to limit clashes that might happen on site by catching them first in in the model. Um, acid information this this is really just the information that's put into every element, every family that goes into a model. And this is, this is mainly what GSA use the, the models for. They've been getting uh, Revit models for their last few projects. And they find this very useful for um, looking at materials and particularly m and &E plant. 
and then facility management and building operations uh, as well. They haven't quite got into, into that yet using the, the model, but it, it is their aim to, to do that in the near future. I'll pass you over now to Antonio, who's going to talk more about uh, BIM. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll uh, suppose I will take a before I start the second half of it, <laughs> I suppose of this presentation, I suppose I introduce myself uh, a bit. Yeah, um, I study in Italy as a I'm an Italian. Um, I study what is called in Italian the geometry, which will be kind of a technical architect. There is no really an equivalent in uh, in Ireland or in UK, as it's come from a Napoleon school system. Uh, that was 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, um, in Ireland, uh, I developed my career uh, with architects. I mostly work with architects. And then um, I decided to study construction management and also then um, do a master in, uh, in BIM. And where I am today with my career, um, my, I suppose, is about um, BIM implementation, really, uh, BIM process, and um, to see to refer to UK, uh, see where we are today, uh, including with uh, um, Ireland, uh, uh, with, uh, um, with the strategy in Ireland, and see actually where we can go from here. So basically, if I come back uh, to this project, uh, uh, as we spoke software, we spoke about digital communication, this is all very important. Uh, and uh, what I, I always try to put into a, a BIM level 2 process, uh, BIM level 2 um, project it is actually the process. So in other words, uh, when we look at, at this project here in Brunswick Street, uh, we really have to say we had a, a good, uh, um, good uh, uh, process on it. We had an EIR, we had a, a BIM execution plan, and uh, a master information delivery plan was uh, updated as we needed. And also, we look uh, at uh, Kobe. At the moment, we are looking uh, <coughs> in details uh, um, Kobe. We, we declined, as uh, it was part of the requirement in uh, EIR. So, if I look at, just a minute. So basically, initially, I, I, I see, I intentionally uh, created three, um, point on this slice here, you look at the past 1192, okay, on the BIM process, and you're looking at the strategy, really, and intentionally I left the EIM there, the Ascent Information Manager. So at the very early stage, the client actually has to see what we want and how we're going to do this. And um, uh, thanks to, we, ha we have now uh, also the RII template that explained the EIR and the, in black and white, you can see there, we look at the project information, technical management, and commercial needs of, uh, of the client. At this stage, you might not be able to answer all the question. And uh, so what you, are, what you, are, uh, you won't really do is not to uh, deny that it's there. By not having an answer, it doesn't mean that you don't have to deal on the next stage on the BEP. And sometimes you have to. You have to do like this. So you have a, a stage where you agree, disagree, or negotiate. That's the way I see it. Very important is when the, the EIR was completed is that the information of the EIR are communicate and transfer correctly into a BEP. As you know, one thing uh, we have to be aware of in the industry, you always have a, a pre-contract BEP and then you have a post-contract BEP. Sometimes these two, B, uh, these two uh, BP are, uh, one of them is missing. Okay, so we have to always make sure that we, uh, when, when we prepare, we prepare this pre-contract uh, um, uh, BEP when we go for a bid for the tender, yeah? And then what we do, we put it together, the EIR, the BEP, uh, pre-contract and then we have a BP post-contract and that is critical and that was very critical in this project as well. So as a, 
All the information from the DEP and the design team sat together, all the stakeholders agree and everything. You have uh, to develop this PP, which is not one version. There's been a, ve a revision on it, as a BIM is really a, a dynamic environment. That's how we call it. It's quite a challenge to predict everything from the very early stage of uh, EIR. <laughs> you know, it, it, so you, you do need uh, to be a little bit dynamic. When I say dynamic, uh, I say in the sense that uh, you have to always keep uh, what is uh, in your uh, uh, agenda on EIR, on the BP, and then uh, when you do clash detection, when you go, uh, you look at the um, CIC protocols and everything, you might say, okay, we can do that, we can do that, we can change, we can give more, we can improve a little bit the level of uh, details, the level of information on the, this particular family. So you have to try to find the balance between when do you need a, a revision of BP and when actually is just normal workflow to be dynamic in this environment. And that's uh, in order really to make a good master, um, um, master information delivery plan, you actually need a very good master information. Um, uh, you need a, a model um, uh, that uh, can uh, uh, so this fight, what are the needs on site? And then uh, as you are on site, for example, you have to also create the packages. You have to create the door packages, window packages. So the challenge there is really to be able to coordinate both of, of them, site needs and uh, package needs. So we are now working uh, on this, uh, the, the model is completed, the geometry are completed. Uh, and what we are uh, looking now, we are looking at the best uh, approach for the client to use a copy data that we are developing in the model. And uh, yeah, we are really on the uh, late stage of, of this. So what is left now is to populate uh, the model with uh, copy data that uh, they can uh, actually uh, use for their FM system. So, as a, at the end of a project, uh, it's probably my, my personal approach, and that's what I brought it into MOLA as well, uh, that is well shared, it's actually review where we are, what have we done, where are we here, where are we going to go next. And as we were talking about this presentation here with Alan, Sean, we were saying, but uh, what Communication still is a key factor. How do you communicate? The different way of communication. Pass 1192 is there, yeah? We all agree it's there. But how many times have you walked around the city, okay? And you meet uh, two tourists, yeah? With uh, a map on their hands, yeah? Phone here, yeah? With Google map, and they still ask you, excuse me, where can I find this place? Yeah? So <laughs> the point they're making here, Bainsey has been say previously. Bainsey, oh yes, I have a pass 1192 to 2013, 3, 14, yes, it's all good, it's a tick box. But how do you actually interpret them? How do you use? So the industry really needs directions. A team needs direction. I might need a direction someday. You know? So um, there is a, a stage where uh, uh, there is a standard and then there is an interpretation of, of a standard. By looking at this, I, I just, uh, I found this, uh, this uh, slide here, I found very interesting, I'd like to share when we will pop up. The evolution of technology, the evolution of actually we communicate. Okay. So, they start with uh, papyrus. Yeah. And then, uh, if you look at the gap there, 100 AD paper was invented in China, okay? And then you look uh, at uh, 1000 AD pencil. And then you look at 1400, there was the first printing process, I think it was in Germany. And now, so you look at a text editing, that was the way they were communicating people. Now you look optical signals and the, around the 16th century. And then you have audio signals. 
and then uh, you have uh, another tool, optical and audio signals. And I suppose that's where we are in this stage. And if you look at the evolution <coughs> since uh, 1969, it's almost vertical. So we are going fast, we are learning faster, and we need things faster. <laughs> Technology needs also be approached by technique. Brunelleschi invented what for today is very normal for us having a, a prospective view in Revit, yeah? But the evolution of actually having a, a, a linear perspective back in, in the 1400, 1400, it was revolutionary. That allowed many architects to express their design and to build churches that in these days, like in Florence, we go and we admire. So back uh, into where we are, we are really looking at, at uh, the UK BIS strategy 2011. This is, was a very ambitious program. And as was mentioned by Alex before me, they really focus, they look at what is the public sector. How can we improve the public sector? How can we make more efficiency? And that's, we have a, a very good starting point when we say in the BIM level two implementation from, from UK. And uh, actually, I will not go as uh, Alex did already perfect analysis <laughs> on it <laughs> uh, as uh, the, uh, I suppose, our beam level two evolved. I uh, just want to show this uh, slice in here. So my approach, my philosophy, if you like, whenever there is a problem, there is an opportunity. Okay, so in radio, you have a problem, but uh, the target of 2016 as a BIM level two mandatory in, uh, in UK, and that's what we are following at the moment. It can be a problem, but it can also be an opportunity for many people. So if you embrace this process, it's actually an opportunity. The problem is you cannot tender a project BIM level two if you don't have a BIM level two capability. So. It's about companies, about strategy, it's all about them. I'm not here to say it's right or wrong. I'm sure there will be market for the traditional approach as well in the next four or five years in UK, in, in Ireland. But it's all about where you want to go, really. So, so in, here in Ireland, yeah, we are following, uh, we also have a strategy, four years, and uh, we are really looking uh, in uh, MOLA, we are really looking at close a leadership standard education, training, and procurement. Procurement is the big word, in my opinion, these days when it comes to BIM level two. Yeah, procurement, there is, uh, yeah. I think we need more research into it. I think we need more uh, understanding. I think we need more collaboration of looking at what is the procurement and what is the BIM process. And uh, coming from uh, the National BIM Council, this is the question and answer that I ask to myself, I ask to my colleagues, and I monitor the company that I work with. I look uh, as a, at the end of the day, we are all human beings. Uh, we spoke about uh, uh, te uh, technique, but it was very interesting to hear this morning uh, uh, Morale, behavior, as we know in management we have a different school of thought. I, my is a, a behavior as a starting point and then I explain to the other three or four. But this is really, if you want to ask uh, to yourself a question, how do I feel when I use Revit? For example, I am anxious it's because you have no skill, you have never used Revit before. Yeah? This is something that you can do sometimes, and I, I use this uh, uh, as a, uh, as a uh, survey in the, in, in the company. Every three months I send uh, to, <laughs> to monitor the gap of implementation, and that's uh, where I'm living for today. Thank you. Thank you.